So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is released. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. Um, if you'll open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, today we are going to look at the continuing story of God setting up his purposes. In Galatians, we are told when the time had fully come, God began to move in history to deliver his promises of a Savior who would give himself so that our sin might be forgiven and access to our Father in heaven might be opened again through faith in that Savior. That's the essence of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus was the Savior who had been promised from the very fall into sin. So that we might have the forgiveness we need, we might have the ability to step into the presence of the Father eternally. Because that door had been shut at the fall into sin. And so, the Father moved in history to make sure that his promises would come forth. And last week, in the first 25 verses of Luke chapter 1, we saw the promise of John the Baptist. The angel Gabriel shows up and says to Zechariah as he's offering incense in the temple, Hey, here I am. Now we are told that Zechariah and Elizabeth, both from the line of Aaron, and that they fulfilled the law of God blamelessly. There is a, the credentials that are given them are very interesting. And so Gabriel goes to a couple that has served God flawlessly as much as human beings can. They follow the Mosaic Code, though, flawlessly. And then he met a need in their lives because Elizabeth was barren, even though she was past childbearing age. We talked about the disgrace of that last week. And the last thing we saw is that when Elizabeth became pregnant, she put herself into exclu uh, to seclusion for five months so that she might, you know, by the time she steps out into the world, everyone knows she is great with child. We're at the end of the five months now that Elizabeth has been in seclusion and the angel Gabriel now moves because the word about Elizabeth is about to start getting out and the angel had a purpose for that news to be able to bring it as a sign before the news got around to Galilee. Today I've entitled the message, When God Invades Our Space or our reality. Because obviously Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the God-man. He was the God of the universe who became a human being so that he might live under the law for us. And so as we look at today's message, we've seen his forerunner, which had been predicted, John the Baptist, being prophesied into existence by an angel. And now we're going to see the Messiah himself, as he is promised by the same angel that had confronted Zechariah in the temple. So, we are in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Just remember all of the translations or the scriptures that you'll see up here today projected are my translations. And so it's very important for you to have your own translation of the Bible. So you can take notes and I can explain differences and you might like my way of doing it better. You might like the translation's way, whatever. It's always good for us to learn that way. So, verses 26 to 27. Then in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin contracted for marriage to a man by the name of Joseph who was from the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So, it was in Elizabeth's six months. I've already mentioned that. Elizabeth is in seclusion for five months. She's stepping out to let everyone see that she's pregnant. And the angel moves so that the word which the angel would bring about Elizabeth would be a testimony to Mary. It would be a sign that what the angel was saying was true because Mary needed all the encouragement that she could get, right? So, it was in Elizabeth's six months. Gabriel shows up again. By the way, Gabriel showed up to Zechariah, he showed up to Daniel. That's when we first run into Gabriel. He was one of those messengers of God that would bring 
God's people special messages for the times in which they lived. So obviously, Zechariah and Mary, at the advent of what we call New Testament times, Gabriel comes because there are some epoch shaping events that he will be announcing. So Gabriel shows up. Um, Nazareth. And you know enough, if you've been around the New Testament long enough, that Nazareth was considered a backwater. It wasn't on the trade routes. You could see the trade routes from there. Well, no, you really couldn't. You had to travel quite a ways. And so it was just, it was a backwater. If you think about Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're in the hill country of Judea. They are in the place where it's happening. And now, and that's where they, God put the forerunner of the Messiah. And then he puts the Messiah in this backwater, out of the way of everyone. And it, it's, an, it's amazing that God used such an out-of-the-way place. And he, the angel Gabriel came to a virgin. The Greek word is parthenos. You can hear the word parthenon in there if you know any of Greek, arche, or Greek structure, architecture. And, uh, but the, the word parthenos means virgin. It's going to become very clear that it means virgin as we go on because Mary starts describing herself. And there's, a, there's this, if you ever want to find out, when you're looking at a Bible translation, you're saying, is this a Bible translation that is faithful to what the Bible says? One of the scriptures you need to look at is Isaiah 7, 14. We'll see it today. If they translate the Hebrew word Alma as young woman, it means that they are grinding a theological axe that you do not want sharpened on your head. Because the word Alma most often meant virgin. There are some contexts where it appears that it could be translated young woman without knowing whether the person is a virgin or not. However, if you are a Bible translator of the Old and New Testament, it's easy to see that the word is virgin because the New Testament translates the Greek word or the Hebrew word virgin. And the Septuagint makes certain that we understand. And so all of those things, if you ever see in Isaiah 7, 14, when it says, behold, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call his name Emmanuel, if it says young woman, more than likely that's not going to be your most faithful translation of the Bible. And that's always one of the ones that I tell people to turn to and look. You can check that today if you want. Okay, so this was a virgin. This was a young woman who was contracted to be married. I don't write the word engaged or pledged to be married because those things don't mean the same things in our cultures today that they meant back then. Um, Often, as early as 10 years of age, young women were contracted out for marriage. For all practical purposes, legally and otherwise, they were now married. The only problem is, or not the only problem, the only situation that they faced was that they would not cohabitate, they would not have intimacy with the person they were contracted to until they were of appropriate age. Roman law said you had to be at least 12 to marry. And you say, why did they do it so early? Remember the lifespan. Okay? They were, it, having babies was without hospitals, etc. And the things that we understand about helping in childbirth, it was a far more risky endeavor. And so it was the young women that were having the babies more than the older women, of course. And so the... Uh, they would have these contracts that they would do, and then the, the man would go about making sure that the household was ready for the time when his bride-to-be was ready, and then they would come together as husband and wife. That was the big marriage celebration and the feasts and all that stuff. But they had already, they were legally married back when the thing was contracted. It's not the same as our engagement by any stretch of the imagination. Our engagements are basically a promise to marriage. They're not a contract. It's not the same as breaking a contract when you break a promise. A woman who was in Mary's state of being contracted, um, the only way out of the relationship was divorce. She would, it was only could be broken by divorce. And if her husband died during the contract period, she was a widow. 
So she'd be a virgin widow. I mean, just think about the, the contradiction in that to our minds because of how we view things. But for them, that's why I wanted to t- do something different than to say pledge to be married or engage because it's a far different concept than what we even we can understand from our culture. So Mary was contracted, uh, this virgin was contracted for marriage to a man by the name of Joseph. He was from the house of David. Okay, so it was Joseph or David's house. He was right away, we're, we're going, oh, okay, this is someone who is in the right bloodline. We don't get the fullness of the bloodline from Luke. Matthew has Joseph's bloodline in it. Luke has a bloodline in chapter 3, but it appears to be Mary's bloodline, just to point out that um, Jesus has the blood of David in him through Mary's line, and then he has the right to the throne by adoption through Joseph's line. And so that's how this thing is coming together. Resolves a curse in uh, the book of Jeremiah because Jeconiah was cursed, he was a king, and none, it was said none of his descendants will reign on the throne. And Joseph was one of his descendants. But Jesus wasn't. He was adopted. And so he got the right to reign on the throne without having the bloodline, the cursed bloodline that God said none of his descendants will reign on the throne. So uh, the virgin's name was Mary. Obviously, we are all well aware of that. Verses 28 to 29. When he arrived, Gabriel arrived, he said to her, Rejoice, you who have received a gracious gift. The Lord is with you. But she was confused by his greeting and considered carefully what sort of greeting it might be. Notice it said that fear gripped Zechariah last week. He was greatly afraid. That's not the situation that we have with Mary. We're not told that she was gripped with fear. We aren't, the angel says later, don't be afraid. So there had to be some fear level rising up. I mean, she's in the presence of an angel and all of this weighty stuff. But the first thing that we're told about is she's just confused by what's going on and trying to figure it all out. But, so she is called one who has received a gracious gift. Um, the word is, describes someone who's received a freely given gift. And so the angel shows up and says, God has given you something very precious. And God has given it to you freely. That's why Mary had to think about it. What what is he giving me? (laughs) What has he given me? What is it that I have that's different than any other young Hebrew daughter of Abraham, you know, who is... So, I mean, you can understand why she'd be confused because she's going, you know, huh, I can't see what this is. That's why, of course, you'd be confused. You'd be confused, too, if an angel showed up and you don't think of yourself as very special. You're just a normal Christian wandering around and an angel shows up and says, you've received this amazing gift from God. Well, you know enough from Mary now to say, I'm going to wait until he speaks a little bit more because he defines it as he goes. But it wasn't at first. It was like, what are you talking about? She lives in a backwater called Nazareth, living in an area oppressed by the Romans, just like every other area of Judea. What are we talking about? The uh, angel said, the Lord is with you. That's, uh, I mean, imagine she's probably around 12. She may have been slightly younger because you could contract even earlier. Remember, these were arranged marriages. Sometimes contracted marriages, especially in other cultures, would happen just about at birth. And so this is a young lady, probably still before puberty, probably because of what happens next, had just reached puberty. And so we have this situation, the Lord is with you. So she says she's confused, it says she's confused, but I like the part where it says she's thinking. Sometimes your translations say pondering. That just simply means carefully considering what has been said. You know how you can do that when you're hearing, if you've ever received a prophetic word publicly or in a situation where it's really the Lord, it's kind of like the space-time continuum changes around you. And you know what I'm talking about. Because suddenly it's like everything opens up and the words slow down and your mind speeds up and you are able to think about the words that are being spoken even as they are being spoken in a way that normally you don't think you can think that fast. And the implications, when I get a word like that, I'm bringing up what could this mean and dismissing ideas as I'm hearing the word which is coming forth. 
That's what is to be described with Mary. She's considering carefully. Now, I don't think that a lot of time has passed. Again, it's like the space-time continuum opened up, her mind speeded up, or everything slowed down. Whatever the case, Mary was able to quickly start to think, what in the world is going on? And think about all of the different things that were happening. So then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen closely. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will give him the name Jesus. The angel uses a form of the Greek verb which you could translate, stop being afraid. However, in later Greek, that lost, and this is later Greek by this time, that lost some of its intent. And so he may have just been saying, you know, I know you're feeling uneasy. Just, you know, don't worry about it at any stretch. He says, you found favor with God. I want you to think about the fact that Elizabeth... And Zechariah, before the angel shows up by them, we're told all their credentials. What was their bloodline? Well, we've got that from Mary and Joseph, but we don't have the obeyed or fulfilled the law perfectly. Is there anything that she had done? She was a pure child in the house of Israel. She was like Moses, who was a special child from the very beginning. We have nothing on Mary. And I think one of the reasons is simply this, because if the... Father God is going to give someone the favor of having the Messiah. It's a given that the young lady has been prepared. That she is the one. Remember, uh, Jewish young women, they all dreamed of being the mother of the Messiah. And Mary was the one. And that's why when she starts hearing this, she has to be thinking to herself, I mean, you, I, I can't even imagine the, the rushing of blood, the flush of, of knowledge and the understanding and the, the heightened sense of awareness because of everything that she is experiencing as she is hearing the message about who she is in history and what it is that's going to happen to her. This has to be an amazing moment for her. By the way, some of your translations, the King James especially, has the words, blessed are you among women, in Gabriel's mouth. Um, so if you see that where it says, Gabriel says, you know, Mary, greetings, blessed are you among women, that is pretty clearly not in the text there. It's what Elizabeth says to Mary later on, blessed are you among women. Um, there's a whole lot of manuscripts that don't have that in for Gabriel. And then some of the manuscripts have it in. And so when you see that, you go, well, Elizabeth said it. If Gabriel said it, no one would have dropped that out. However, because Mary was such a highly esteemed figure in the early church, it would make sense that some manuscripts would bring it from Elizabeth's speech into Gabriel's mouth. So that's how you make the determination when you're looking at, hey, there's, some, tr- there's tr- some transcripts that have that in. You ask yourself, why would they have dropped it out if it was there? And the answer is they wouldn't have. They just wouldn't have. Because Mary was an esteemed figure. They wanted to do everything they could. And so that's why the current translations, and I follow that example, don't have that in Gabriel's mouth. However, it was very clearly spoken by Elizabeth. So... Everyone has that. So the angel says to her, you have found favor. You're going to conceive and you're going to give birth to a son. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to name him one who saves. That's what Jesus means. It's the Greek form of Joshua. And um, you could also, you know, change the vowels a little bit and say Yeshua. But Joshua is the accepted way we translate the Hebrew word. And so the Greek form of Joshua is Jesus. And the word just simply means saves or one who saves. And so the angel's saying right up front, just like John the Baptist. I mean, think about this for a minute. They're being told what they're going to name their kids. What does that say about the importance of names? I mean, think about that. The name that we put on our children, very important. We need to think and pray about it so that we are not, you know, (laughs) missing something about what God wants to put in their life. So I think God works with parents' wills all of the time to make this work out. So, okay. 
So his, his name would be Jesus. I already quoted Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord will give a sign to you. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel means God with us. So Isaiah, as he got the prophecy, was saying she's going to recognize that he is God who has come, become a man. She's going to call him that. But the name the angel told him, told her to name him was Jesus. So... Um, interesting prophecy from Isaiah. By the way, that's the scripture I told you to always check when you're thinking about getting a Bible translation. Here's what the angel says about Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give the throne of his father David to him. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will not end. This is heady stuff. You're, just be merry for a moment. 11 years old, 12 years old, maybe 13. Getting close to when she would have gotten married. And you're being told that all of these, you're going to have a son and all of these things are going to apply to your son. And by the way, who's telling you this? Uh, Gabriel, the guy that spoke to Daniel. This supernatural being who shows up as an obvious angel and says to you, let me tell you what's going to be going on with your life. <laughs> be prepared for weird things, okay? Just be prepared for weird things. This is, this is, this is weird. I'm, not, I'm just saying this. Mary had to be, I mean, no wonder she was confused. She was being made, as far as Israelite women concerned, the center of Israelite history for the women of Israel. Bearing the Messiah, that had to be amazing. He will be great, the son of the Most High. Interesting, Gabriel said to Zechariah that John would be great in the eyes of the Lord because the Lord would see him as great. Remember, he's greater than anyone that had been born of women before. However, the least in the kingdom is greater than John because the kingdom is something we step into as we fight against our natural inertia and antipathy and all of the things that prevent us from going after God. And when we step into the kingdom, we have fought a lot to get there. We've overcome a lot to get there. John overcame a lot to get where he was, and Jesus says to get in the kingdom, you're going to be even greater than John. It's that much work. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been violently advancing, and those who are able to put down their own inertia and violently put it down and to get over every obstacle that's in the way are going to enter it. And so, however, John's called great in the eyes of God. Jesus is just called great. Because, of course, he was God with us. He would be great. It's called the Son of the Most High. The Most High is a Hebrew, uh, like a, a Semitic way of referring to God, the Most High. And the Son of the Most High, amazing picture. He would be the Son of the Most High. Which we understand that as Christians to mean more than just a Son of the Most High or just someone who is specially blessed by God. We're, we, we receive it at a much higher level than that, even these first references to it. Um, David's throne he would receive. And he would, uh, it says God will give him the throne of his father David, which means we understand right away he's the Messiah. This is, what, this is the word that says, by the way, in case you've missed it up until this particular point in time, this is Messiah, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. Jacob's house was over all of Israel. By the way, there's a natural Israel and there's a spiritual Israel, okay? Jacob's house, and it's going to be a never-ending kingdom. Jesus, when he suffered and died, instituted that kingdom. When he rose again, he instituted that kingdom. And when he sent his spirit, he instituted that kingdom. He is now reigning on high through his people on earth. There will come a time when he comes personally to demonstrate that he's been reigning. But until that time, and by the way, that's fast approaching. Amen. Because the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. That's clear. Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot, Jesus said, by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That means 
in the lifetime of many of us that Jesus' words were fulfilled from 2,000 years ago almost. That's amazing. We're living during that time. When God invades space, we're going to, that, those words, our space, that, that's going to mean more than we can even begin to understand in the future. So it's a never-ending kingdom. So now Mary's got some questions. Remember what Zechariah's first question was? Well, what's going to be the sign of this? And, the, and Gabriel standing there going, I'm the sign. But now I'm going to make you the sign. And he lost his ability to speak in here. Well, Mary doesn't go in that direction. Mary probably wasn't, Mary probably hadn't lived long enough to develop that level of cynicism, let's just be honest, right? <laughs> Mary said to the angel, how will this happen since I am not having sexual relations with a husband? So she's seeking direction. I mean, she's thinking, well, am I going to marry Joseph and this is going to happen? What's going to happen? She understood. She's asking the question because it sounds like it's imminent. There's something that we're probably not picking up from the conversation that makes Mary know. I mean, have you, have, when, sometimes when you're having an experience with God, God's saying something to you, but you know something in the background automatically. So more than likely, Mary had this background knowledge that this is happening right now. This is not something that's being delayed. We know that that was the case because of what happens later as we follow the timeline. This did not happen three months later. This was happening at the moment. And so Mary's like, how will this happen since I'm not having sexual relations with a husband? Are we supposed to move up the marriage? What's going on? By the way, um, I'm very clear about what she was talking about. The Greek word no is, it means sex, having sexual relations. It doesn't help anybody in our culture to use euphemisms rather than what is really being spoken about. No one in her culture would hear no, meaning the word which speaks about knowledge. They would know instantly, she was saying, I'm not having sexual relations with anybody. Because that's what the word meant. And when we take euphemisms, and this is throughout the Bible, because in English we don't want to be so offensive, we've got to be a little bit religious, and we don't want people to be offended that we might think that, oh my goodness, Mary would talk about sexual relations. Well, they, they, she understood biology 101. And she was going, I'm not currently having a sexual relationship with anyone. How in the world am I going to get pregnant? She understood how pregnancy happened. There was no stork involved. She was well aware of that. <laughs> she was not yet to the take-home stage of the marriage contract. That also was the case. And so she had to be thinking, what in the world? How is this supposed to happen? Uh, am I supposed to go to Joseph and, and, and say, let's get, move the marriage up? And of course, she wouldn't have done it. Her parents would have had to do it and all that sort of stuff. And the angel gets rid of the problem right up front. Okay? The angel responded to her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. As a result, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Can you imagine? I just want you to think about this. That's okay, Mary. You don't need a man. God's going to take care of this. You're 12. Well, I've never heard of that before. This is, don't assume she knew Isaiah 7, 14. They didn't read the Bible much. It was just a synagogue reading, you know, thing. Don't assume she knew that promise of that scripture. We know the promise of that scripture because of this. Don't assume she did. And so this was one of those things where the Mary's head probably spun a little bit. Hey, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Now, we know from the book of Acts that Jesus says to the disciples, Hey, don't leave Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. So there was going to be an empowering that comes upon Mary, just in the same way that the disciples had the Holy Spirit come upon them. Same Greek word, same picture of the Holy Spirit coming upon. If the Holy Spirit comes upon someone, power is released. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson and David and the Old Testament heroes, even on King Saul. 
And, you know, powerful things would happen. They were anointed to be able to do incredible things. Saul was empowered to raise up a kingdom from nothing. Now, he made some messes, to put it mildly, but he was anointed to do an amazing thing. And David, of course, was anointed by God. When Samson had the power of the Holy Spirit come on him, the bonds that he had on his hands turned to ashes. When the power of the, when the Spirit comes upon you, the picture of power is intense. And that's what the angel is saying. By the way, Mary, don't worry about it. The same one that hovered over the earth in all of its formlessness and brought it all together is able to handle this. Okay. The power of the Most High. The Greek word is dynamis. It's the normal word for power. It just simply says God's power is going to touch you. When we talk about the energy that is released in our spiritual gifts, we talk about the supernatural energies of God. It's not the same Greek word, but it has the same idea behind it, that there is supernatural energy, supernatural power that was going to enter her body and it was going to cause a conception to take place apart from a male seed. It's the way it is. That's what a virgin birth is. Biology 101. He said, you're going to be overshadowed. The power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. That is an interesting word. Um, It's the word which is used by both Matthew, Mark, and Luke to describe what happened at the Transfiguration. It says the glory of the Lord showed up and it overshadowed them. It's like they were standing in the midst of God's power and glory. There was an overshadowing going on. Uh, In Acts chapter 5, verse 15, we hear this. This is an overshadowing that is being described. The same Greek word. As a result, this is what was talking about what was happening as God moved among the people. As a result, also they carried the sick into the wider streets and lay them on stretchers and mats that when Peter came by, his shadow might overshadow some of them. That's interesting because I I purposely translated it redundantly because it says his shadow would overshadow. And that has led some people to believe that there was a manifestation of God's presence a shadow of God's presence on Peter, and that is what is being spoken about, like the cloud of transfiguration. That that's what was being released from Peter as he was walking down the street. And that would mean that, you know, the Lord may have come in that cloud, the glory cloud that showed up in the tabernacle. Think about that. God is in the business. By the way, our bodies are sometimes known as God's house. And God showed up in the glory cloud in the tabernacle. God showed up in the glory cloud in uh, the temple. And it it may simply be that God, this glory cloud came. Her parents were like, what's this all about? But it's an overshadowing. That's the whole picture. Uh, In the uh, Septuagint, if you really want to find out what glory, what, what the word overshadow means, this has nothing to do with God, but it teaches us how this word is used. It says, the property of a wealthy man is a strong city and its glory greatly overshadows everything else around it. Okay, It's glory. And so the property of a wealthy man is a strong city, especially in that day and age. They could have you know, huge defenses. They could have lots of people to help them and protect him. The property makes him into a strong city. The glory of his residence overshadows everything around. That's influence. That's what it's talking about. And so I believe that overshadow is just simply speaking of that supernatural influence that comes as God draws near. We already knew the Holy Spirit was going to come upon him. And there may have been like the, the cloud showing up at the same time when God began to change Mary's body so that she would conceive in a way that had never been done before. So there would be no human father. As a result, the child would be called God's son. Again, pointing out the uniqueness of Jesus. This is not a woman who was impregnated by the gods of Greek mythology. This is a woman who was created to be the Messiah bearer. And God's power, in the same way that he was able to form the dirt of the ground, 
and bring forth Adam in the same way that he was able to take out of the side of Adam Adam, a section and form it into a woman. In that same way, he was able to reach inside of Mary and form the conception of Jesus Christ. That doesn't seem like it's so hard for the God who brought everything together, do you think? Now, the angel was not asked for a sign. However, gives her a sign. Also, take note of your relative Elizabeth. She has conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for no promise from God is impossible. Buckle your seatbelts. This is such a filled couple verses of the Bible. The angel gives a sign. We know about the sign because we had a chance to see what Gabriel worked with Zechariah and Elizabeth on. And so Elizabeth had just gotten out of seclusion. She's in her six months. And so the angel says, hey, even your cousin or your relative is going to have a baby. She is now in her sixth month. And so Mary's going to very easily be able to check that. In fact, we don't see it today, but when we get to the next scriptures, we're going to find out Mary hoofs it down to Judea to find out. She's like, was this... Did I fall on my head and have a visionary experience? It doesn't make any sense. She gets down by Elizabeth and finds out, oh my, okay, this is all real. And uh, God does even more to encourage her along the way. Remember, our God is the great encourager. Whenever you are called to do something for God, he will go out of the way to encourage you. He will go out of the way to make sure that he gives you the encouragement you need so that you can overcome whatever it is that's in front of you. Remember that about God, because when you are called to do something for him, whether it's ethically and you know there's something that you can't do at work or you can't do because someone's asking you to do something, he will give you the strength and the ability to say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things. And he will give you the encouragement along the way so that you make the proper choice if you are listening and if you are asking. By the way, that's a lot better than making the wrong choice and learning to regret. That is a teacher, by the way. Regret is a teacher. It's not a very fun teacher, and we have to learn to live above regret in our lives as we serve the Lord Jesus so that it doesn't hold us back from doing the calling or purpose that God has given us. One of the great enemies of Satan is regret in our lives when we have confessed our sins and when we have come before our God and been forgiven. And then Satan will use, and boy... I I should speak especially to the, the younger people in this room because the older people know exactly what I'm talking about. But one of the great hammers that Satan uses on people who are more experienced in their lives is the issue of regret. And he makes them believe that they have disqualified themselves because there is, there's, Satan's job is to make you realize how awful you are because of your past choices. And we have to live above regret. So it's important for us to, to ask God ahead of time and then find out, you know, and say, oh, I know what's the right thing to do. And he'll give you the encouragement to go through whatever it is that you have to go through so you don't make those choices that Satan can use later against you and hammer you into thinking that you no longer are worthy of God's call or purpose in your life. God's the God of forgiveness. Look at how Jesus forgave Do you know, if you ever want to figure out how God uses people that are really not that nice, just look at Jacob. (laughs) Jacob wasn't very nice. I mean, he was a very not nice person. He was crabby and complaining, lied to his brother even after his brother said, I want to help you. Oh, yeah, you go, I'll follow behind. His brother leaves, he goes, whoa, the other way. It was, it was, I mean, what an individual. When he finally got the word about Joseph, it's like his heart was turned and he came into the fullness of God in his life. And from that point on, watch what he says because it's like every word that comes out of his mouth is a prophetic word from God because something happened to revitalize his heart and his life. But when you think about Some of the people that the Lord has used. Samson, good night. He fulfilled God's purposes for 40 years, acting as a judge of Israel, and you would not have wanted him as a neighbor. He might have burned your house down just for fun. He wasn't a nice man. Didn't obey God very well. 
was someone who was always falling into trouble. Think about the people God uses and realize that he's the God who can forgive when we turn our hearts to him. We don't have to live in regret. But it's, like I said, you can do it the hard way or the easy way. The easy way is saying to God, Lord, the right way, I know the right way, the ethical way to do this thing. Please give me the grace to make the right choice and to be able to be encouraged along the way so that I know that you are with me. And that's what was happening with Mary. She needed encouragement along the way. And so the angel gave her encouragement. And then that famous phrase the angel says, um, nothing is impossible with God. Well, it doesn't really say that, but it's, it's close enough. Uh, no promise from God is impossible is probably one of the best ways to say it. Um, I, no word of provision is another way you could say because the Greek word is rhema, and rhema is more than... Rhema can just mean a, a word or a statement. It depends on the context, like every other word. But when it's talking about something God is speaking, it's more of a promise. It's more of a promise of a provision. Uh, the literal words here, literally, okay, if you're going to just be really wooden out of the Greek language, it's for every word from God is not impossible. For every word from God is not impossible. Well, you know how we clean that up, right? Because we don't talk that way. We would not say every word of God is not impossible. We'd say nothing is impossible. Just the way we speak, because it doesn't fit in our heads otherwise real well. And the way, mean word means promise. No promise of God is impossible. Remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness? And Jesus was told by Satan, hey, turn this bread into, or turn these rocks into bread so that you can feed yourself because you've been fasting for a while and God isn't taking care of you. And Jesus says, hey, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. The Greek word there is rhema. Same word is right here. And Jesus was quoting Moses in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. I've already referred to it once today. Um, but this is what it said, and I translate it from the Septuagint. This is what Moses said in Deuteronomy 8, that Jesus was quoting, and Moses uses the word rhema. I mean, the translators of the Septuagint use the word rhema to, for Moses' Hebrew words. Moses says, you will be reminded all the way how the Lord God led you in the desert so that he might let you experience trouble to test you and find out what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commands or not. He allowed you to experience trouble and hunger, and he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, in order that he might announce to you that man does not live upon bread alone, but that he will live upon every word of provision that goes forth from the mouth of God. Say so the word of provision is manna. And then Moses says right after this in the next verse, and your feet did not swell and your, your, your clothes did not wear out. And so the word Rama there is speaking about supernatural provision in a big way. God gave them supernatural provision in their food. He gave them supernatural provision in their health. Their feet didn't swell. And he gave them supernatural provision in their clothing. And so God was taking care of every need. And God let them go through the test so that they would learn that when God gave a promise of provision support, that they could count on that. And so that's the word which is being used. When it says, man does not, or that uh, the angel says that no promise of God is impossible. Hold on to this one because sometimes God says things to us that sound so over our heads. But it's not impossible. No promise of God is impossible. He's able to handle it. Let's just think about a 12-year-old girl. By the way, you're going to have a kid. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the Son of God. And oh, by the way, you're not going to have a sexual relationship to make this happen. Okay. Do you think that that might be bigger than anything that you've ever been promised? And yet God brought it forth. God made it happen. So for that reason, when we hear God's statements, I mean, there's tons of scriptural statements that God will not leave us or forsake us. The, the promises of Matthew chapter 6, that God knows how to take care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, won't he also take care of us? We don't have to worry. If we do worry, it's a sign of little faith, and that's not honoring God, so let's just not worry at all, because God is able to take care of his promises of provision in our lives. Now, he normally uses the sweat of our brow. That was from Genesis chapter 3. However, He's also very good at bringing the supernatural stuff around if we absolutely need it. 
and just that over and above stuff to show us that he loves us. So now you're Mary. You've been told by the angel all this stuff is going to happen. And you think to yourself, I'm only 12 or 13 years old. How do I respond? And Mary has this exemplary response. Mary said, look, I am the servant of the Lord. May it happen to me as you have promised. Then the angel left her. She just said, I'm the Lord's servant. Now, by the way, when you're a 12 or 13-year-old girl and you're just told you're going to get pregnant without having a sexual relationship, I don't know how quick Mary was. But this has some implications. And Mary had to be quick enough to realize because she's been told she's under contract for marriage. What's, what did her parents say to her on day one and probably every day after that she was around young men? No, no, no. Don't disgrace the family. Don't do the, you know, you understand. It's like, no, we don't, you know, don't, don't go by Joseph alone. Don't go by anybody because if you go early to Joseph and you guys have a sexual relationship and you get pregnant, the disgrace is indescribable. So Mary thinks it true, at least at the level that she's able to say, well, I think God's going to be able to handle this. Let's face it, if God's able to make me pregnant without a man, he can take care of me the other ways too. That's how I, you know, you just draw the conclusion. Oh, God's capable of doing this. He's able to see me through this stuff. So, let it happen. Not let is, let it happen. And then the angel, he says, she says, let it happen to me as you have promised. The word is rhema again. Let that word of provision that you have just given, let it happen to me just like that, according to your rhema. So when God invades our space, it's not always comfortable. It's just not. I don't think that God had a great deal of concern about Mary's comfort level here. When the time had fully come, if he did, don't you think the angel would have waited until her mom and dad were around to give this? Have you ever thought of that? All the angel had to do was wait for mom and dad. And then Mary would have not had to go through the horrible confrontation she had with her parents. And if you didn't think she did, you don't know that culture. And Joseph had already decided to put her away. We learn about that. And the Lord came to him in a dream and said, hey, this... So the angel had to come to Joseph and say, but again, why not tell him ahead of time? Couldn't the angel have had... You know, we have conference calls now. <laughs> you think a conference call is beyond God? Hey, Mary, pay attention. Mary's mom and dad, Joseph, got something to announce. <laughs> what does that mean? It means there are times that it's okay, just like Moses said to the Israelites, for us to step into stressful situations to find out what's in our heart and to whether we will pursue God no matter what it costs. Mary had to face her parents, her relatives, her contracted husband. The wrath of her culture. She never got out from under that, by the way. <laughs> and it reminds us of God's purposes in our lives. Because even though Mary was going to be the one who was chosen to bring forth the Messiah, she still had to grow. She still had a life of learning in front of her. She still had to learn the ways of God. Just like we're learning the ways of God. You know, as Christians, we have doctrines, right? And that's important to have doctrines. Do doctrine just means teaching. We have teachings from the Bible. Jesus Christ is true God, true man. That's a doctrine. Jesus came to save us from our sins. That's a doctrine. If you believe in him as your savior, you will have eternal life and he will put his spirit in you and you will have a relationship with him throughout eternity. That's a doctrine. So we have doctrines. And these doctrines we're taught and we learn because we have the Bible, but we have far more than doctrines. We have our experiences with God that teach us about his ways. 
Most of the things that we experience are well contained in Scripture. You'll find it when you go through your experiences with God. You'll find the examples of it in Scripture. But it's interesting that most of the time before we have the experience, we have a hard time seeing it in Scripture. But once God has knocked the blinders off our eyes through our experience, and all of a sudden we say, oh man, yeah, that happened that same way. That's exactly what David had to be going through. That's what so-and-so had to be going through. When God invades our space, it's never comfortable. But it's right. So grab onto him. Keep close to him. And do not forget that you too are his humble servant. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you for giving us these, this, this humble servant, Mary, and her encounter with the angel so that we can see life released in her in an amazing way. I ask, Lord, that you would, on this day, help us to prepare our hearts for when you invade our space. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.